most of you might be aware that uh, since the human genome has been sequenced, and the more we sequence, the more we realize that protein coding genes are a minor fraction of what our genome encodes for. And much of the genome is transcribed, but it produces non-coding RNAs. And my lab is interested in understanding what do these non-coding RNAs do. The general modus operandi in my lab is to uh, use bioinformatics, computers, maybe 50% of the lab works in bioinformatics, and uh, look at some hypothesis, develop a hypothesis about how these non-coding RNAs may be acting. And finally, we choose a model organism that is suitable for the question that we are asking. So for each non-coding RNA, we often have to go to a different model organism. Uh, my own training has been in yeast. I have used e uh, C. elegans, Drosophila, and uh, later on, I have also worked with uh, clinical samples in humans. And only yesterday, I was giving a similar talk, trying to convince the audience that uh, invertebrate models are very useful for these kind of studies. Now, uh, but then I learned a lot with uh, Dr. V.P. Singh after he joined at the institute and he invited me to give this talk, which is a small portion of what I do and that has some relevance to some protocols that we develop for mouse. So with that minor disclaimer. So this is the problem, one of the problems that we work with. There is a disease called SEA17, spinal cerebellar ataxia 17. If that was a mouthful, you can ignore everything else and just listen to the ataxia part. So ataxia is disordered gait and inability to walk properly. And in humans, the, the gene that is responsible for this disease, when it has a mutation, the, this gene is called Tata binding protein. This is very familiar to molecular biologists. It's what sits on the DNA before the RNA polymerase sits and decides which genes are transcribed. So, but what's special about uh, human TBP? So I worked on yeast many, very many years back. And when we compare yeast to human, the process of transcription itself is conserved. But these genes have acquired a small N-terminal portion which contains a stretch of glutamines. These glutamines are the trouble in this disease. When they expand, these proteins can aggregate and the aggregation of these proteins can result in neuronal cell death. How does the neuronal cell death happen is what is of interest to my group. So very many years back, we started out, when I set up my lab first, we started out with cell lines neuro 2A in this case. And we use two versions of this protein. 16Q here is the non-pathogenic variant. And 59Q there is the pathogenic variant that will aggregate in these cells and eventually result in neuronal cell death. So all the corroborating data is shown, uh, shown on the right side. And uh, we used yeah, and we used a variety of uh, gene expression detection techniques uh, as they came along over the last 10 years and looked at what gene expression profile changes could be detected. And what we found is, what we found uh, very quickly summarized in one slide is that there were changes both in the messenger RNAs that code for proteins and micro RNAs that actually are regulatory small RNAs that control these protein coding gene expression. To summarize all these findings together, one of the microRNAs that's differentially expressed in our studies, and when we looked more widely, we found that it is downregulated in a variety of neurodegenerative disorders. And this microRNA is called MIR-29. Now, we were interested, and at this point, whenever I would give a talk like this, I would be asked that, is one small microRNA, so this is only 19 to 20 nucleotides in size, is it sufficient to bring about any significant change in behavior or in neurodegeneration? How would you study this single microRNA and show that this is important? So we use the standard techniques that molecular biologists use and try to understand how are these microRNAs regulated. In the interest of time, I will just summarize that we eventually found that in the cells that are grown in culture, interferon gamma could induce these effects. It could downregulate this microRNA and induce another microRNA, recapitulating the same changes that we were seeing with polyglutamine proteins. Now, how do we understand, how do we, this we published earlier this year. But at that time, I was thinking about what could interferon gamma be doing in the brain. Now, the moment you think of interferon gamma and brain, you think of glial cells. However, we were growing only neurons in culture. And it would have been difficult to convince any reviewer or reader that these neurons were producing interferon gamma. And that is why we had to wait a long time, although this work was done several years back. In the meantime, we tried to look at the microRNA. 
Now, when I was trying to look at what models are available for looking at the microRNA, as I mentioned before, we use a lot of uh, in vitro studies. In the uh, lab, we used, I will uh, skip these techniques, but suffice to say that here is a summary of literature and techniques that our own lab has used to summarize a number of targets that each microRNA may have. Now, I did not put in a slide introducing what microRNAs are. So, let me take a minute to explain this. MicroRNAs are very small uh, nuclear uh, RNAs which are produced just like mRNAs are produced, but finally they go and bind to other mRNAs, messenger RNAs and prevent protein translation. And the net effect is that a bunch of proteins can be down regulated by a single microRNA. Now, we are talking about a single microRNA targeting a number of mRNAs and this is important because I will be coming back to this at the end of my presentation. In our in vitro studies, we found that a large number of targets could be identified for this microRNA and uh, we, we published our results and these results were in broad agreement with other papers that were also coming out around that time. Uh, some of these uh, uh, tests were done only with one technique and some were um, studied with multiple techniques. So, it was not that we did not have orthogonal techniques to prove that these targets could indeed uh, be targeted by the microRNA. Uh, around this time, uh, VP Singh was, uh, so his ambition and his energy cannot be contained <coughs> in the small animal house that we have at our institute. We were not geared for doing animal experiments in that very um, uh, nice fashion that has been described earlier in the uh, session. But he was trying to convince me that you should look at animals and see whether this is indeed true in the brain or not. And I was very, very reluctant because I was not sure, especially because interferon gamma is involved, I was very worried about infections being confounding factors housing being a problem, all those other things that have been described earlier. And it is to actually VP Singh's credit that he managed to set up the experiment very well and we have had very good rewarding results from this and that is what I am going to share. So now, this was the problem that we had to address at that time. How do we actually knock down just one microRNA in the brain? Now, knocking down genes in uh, general is a, is a general problem, I am sure all of you are aware of it. But in this case, it was further complicated by two features of the microRNA. Firstly, the microRNA, as I mentioned before, is very small. So you have to target just that region in the genome. You do not want to target everything else around it. Secondly, uh, you, so, so we also had India-specific problems. Uh, generating a knockout mouse for this work would be expensive. It would be slow, given our conditions. And further, this microRNA is also expressed in many other tissues in the body. So, we would have to have specific, brain specific methods of knock, uh, knockout and or a uh, inducible knockdown like an SHRNA that can be controlled using tetracycline and so on. So, after considering all these methods and the funding that I had, I had to come up with something else. I had to do something different. So, uh, we also lacked the technical know-how for doing stereotactic injections then. So, then we went on to use one of our colleagues' expertise in peptide-based delivery and merged our interest in neurobiology with their interest in peptide-based delivery and VP Singh's capability in uh, maintaining the animal house and doing developing protocols for animals and then we did this work. So, this is uh, how we did this. So, for that let me first introduce, introduce what is uh, cell penetrating peptides. So, this is from a colleague's lab, uh, the name of the colleague is Dr. Munia Ganguly and uh, with her guidance, we started understanding about this method that is very widely used in uh, her field. So, these are called cell penetrating peptides exemplified by the HIV-1 TAT uh, peptide. These peptides can bind to the surface of a cell and be taken into the cell and deliver a cargo shown here by a blue ball here and then it can be released inside the cell and then it can exert these effects. This cargo can be small molecules, it can be small RNAs, it can be siRNAs and so on. Secondly, we wanted to introduce something that would make this cell penetrating peptide go only to the brain. So, for this we used a peptide that had been reported in the literature. This is derived from the rabies virus and as you know rabies virus is neurotropic and this receptor, since this binds to the acetylcholine receptor, it confers the ability on this peptide to specifically go to neurons. So, we had a neurotargeting arm to this peptide and an additional cell penetrating arm to this peptide and this uh, uh, covalent linkage 
was then allowed to interact with what are called locked nucleic acids. So these are standard antisense molecules which can be used for knocking down microRNAs. And these stars here show that this antisense molecule is modified chemically at four positions to stabilize it in the cell. So we brought all these different capabilities together to create some nanoparticles that can be used for, uh, for transvascular delivery. So then with the limited resources that we had, we could simply do a tail vein injection and then look at the brain. So this is uh, the, in, so we went back to our in vitro system and tested whether it would work on the neurons first, standardize the dose required for it. So we showed that, uh, we found that uh, you need a certain specific ratio. Slight changes in the ratio can completely uh, uh, change the results. HeLa cells would not take up the same peptide, whereas Neuro2A, which is a neuronal cell line, would take up this peptide and you could see fluorescent molecules delivered through this method. We also looked at the mouse brain and here you can see that RVG peptide, which goes to the brain, manages to deliver the cargo, whereas a different peptide, a mutated version of the peptide, will not do the same thing. RVM would be cleared from the system so you can find it in the liver. So after having established these basic parameters, we went on to look at how is the microRNA expressed in the brain. Now here was a surprise. MicroRNAs come in families. So MIR-29, what I have been referring to so far, has two relatives. And these are uh, different from each other only by a couple of nucleotides. So it's very difficult to target them specifically. And when we look at in the cell, it was fine. We had similar expression levels of MIR-29A and B. But in the brain, this was a very different scenario. MIR-29A uh, is expressed very much more highly than MIR-29B. So anything that we use to target both would hit this target first and not this. Uh, this you should note is in the log scale, so we are talking about a huge difference here. So I have shown that the fold change is up in hundreds. And then we uh, developed this protocol where we used a control uh, antisense molecule, LNA is the antisense that knocks down the microRNA. In or a LNA that is specifically targeted against 29A and both these would be used in combination with the peptide that we had earlier standardized. These are the dosages and uh, so on. We tried other dosages and they don't work. And then we looked at four consecutive days, uh, three consecutive injections followed by assays on four consecutive days. So the same day the mice would receive an injection in the morning and in the afternoon we would monitor the gait of them. Mouse. I had a video, but unfortunately, if I switch to the video, then the slides don't come back. So I'm just going to explain how these assays are done. You're probably very familiar with how these assays are done anyway. So one of the things that is done is the mice are picked up by the tail. That's why I asked that question in the morning. And allowed to uh, hang by their tail. And then the hind limb clasping is measured. How far apart they splay their hind limbs is measured. Secondly, we ink the feet of the mice and then allow them to walk on paper. And then we measure the length and you will see some of those footprints from our assays. And third uh, thing that we did is a ledge test. So we leave the mice on the ledge of a cage and then allow them to walk. They can navigate thin um, uh, uh, arena to walk. But when they turn at the corners, they seem, tend to fall off. So using these very homemade uh, assays, uh, we then try to look at what is the effect of knocking down of the microRNA in the brain. And we collected the brain and then separated various tissues. Uh, uh, we sacrificed the animal, collect, uh, collected various tissues, and then separated the brain. Since it's bilaterally symmetrical, we used one part for histology and the other part for RNA studies and protein studies eventually. So when we looked at the knockdown of MIR-29A in the brain, you will remember that this was the more highly expressed variant. And you find that there is a lot of variation in the animals. So these were the pilot experiments done. And then we had to relearn all the statistics to calculate how many animals have to be used. I know there is another talk on how to calculate animal uh, group sizes for these experiments. So I'm not getting into that. So then we looked at the cerebellum cortex and the hippocampus and found that the effect was most uh, striking in the hippocampus. <laughs> then we went on to look at what is the effect on the targets. Now this is the part that I said is important. In the earlier slide, I had a summary of all these targets. These were not just reported by our group. These were also reported by many other groups internationally. And when we looked at these targets in the animal, none of them changed, none. 
So these were seven targets, two PhD students, four years each of work. And all the targets that we had standardized in the lab, none of them changed in the annual. We went on to look at more targets. And there was this one target that was always the one that none of the students wanted to pick up. And this is especially for the students. So this was a target that none of the computers predict. This is not predicted bioinformatically as a target. Even today, if you go back and uh, test for this, there is a target called VDAC1, which is not predicted by the microRNA target prediction software. Why is it not predicted? Because microRNA target binding is predicted by the number of hydrogen bonds that are formed between the two RNA molecules. If they are low, then it's not considered a good binding. Therefore, it's not considered a good target by the computer. But when we did proteomics experiments, so we had done just on a hunch, because none of these targets that we had identified by the conventional method were working in the animal. So we had uh, expressed the microRNA in neuronal cells in the lab and then collected proteins and done a proteomics experiment to see what proteins are really affected. Since the computer is not telling us, we needed an experiment to uh, tell us the same thing. And one of the targets that came up from that study, when we looked at the 3' prime UTR, which is the region that the microRNA is binding, we could see some very weak potential for binding, but something that the computer would not prioritize as a great target. So since everything else had failed, we decided to just look at that target. And lo and behold, this is the effect. Again, this is on log axis. And the uh, whenever the microRNA is knocked down, now remember microRNAs are repressors. So we are looking for the expression of the target. And if the microRNA is knocked down, we expect the target to come up. And you see a huge induction in the uh, expression of the target. You can see that the fold changes are, again, in very large numbers, not what we usually see in molecular biology. Now this managed to get our paper into uh, a respected journal in the RNA field, that is the society journal, uh, RNA, and it was on the cover. But Publishing papers from India, we always scrib is difficult. And one of the things that we sensed is that the reviewers and editors were very honest with us. We said there are many, they said that there are many groups in the world trying to make a knockout of the microRNA. This microRNA is important, everybody agrees. Your molecular biology is fine, but we are not sure about your animal experiments. And uh, we would really like to see the data. And uh, at that time, I realized that justified or not justified, we need to have methods of convincing they eventually were convinced, and it so turned out that just six months after our paper was published, another paper was published by an international leading group that showed exactly the same results, but using a proper knock out, knockout mouse, which we were not really equipped to uh, make here. So it was a really good decision to not go after that path. We would have been scooped. It was better to have done something a little different in this case. Also, there are values to this model that are not there in the knockout model. What is that? This is a late onset disease. So it takes weeks for the uh, mouse model to show the phenotype. Here we are talking about a three-day acute downregulation of the microRNA. We are only affecting that microRNA because we are only using an antisense molecule. We are not disturbing anything in the genome. So we could say confidently, and for the editors, since two groups were saying this, it was very nice to see that both results were corroborating. So in that sense, our model standard valid uh, stood validated. But uh, the uh, reviewers then suggested to us saying that since you've developed this, you should make it available to, uh, you should make it available for others to reproduce. I myself was very jittery about, uh, because there are a lot of stories in the field of neurodegeneration about irreproducibility and so on. So I, uh, so I was going to spend some time on showing you this, but uh, since uh, Dr. Patricia has already shown the value of Joe videos, I will just say this one thing, that wherever I go, I know that even first-year PhD students are very, very familiar with uh, Jove as a publication model. But we don't use it that much to publish our own results. We are usually beneficiaries. We try to learn protocols from there. So we try to uh, publish a uh, Jove paper. And I will not have time to play the whole thing. But this is doubling up as Won't stop. So this is also doubling up as my uh, acknowledgement slides. So uh, these are students, uh, Hemant and Mayuresh. Mayuresh is the experimental biologist. And Hemant was a movie buff. He did not work in my lab. He's not my PhD student. 
but he was always watching hollywood movies and he wanted to learn how to edit movies and uh, so he heard about our problem and came and volunteered saying that i've always wanted to make a movie and i think i have missed the chance because i've already done my phd in chemistry and uh, i'd like to uh, help you make a video of this so they both together made this video and manika reema and uh, were people who did the actual experiments and uh, vijaypal singh munia and myself we were the people who brought in the scientific capabilities and uh, we managed to publish a job paper it was a unique experience because unlike other countries job does not have a provision in india this is for the other indian groups that might be uh, interested in making job papers because um, job uh, does not have a provision in india for their keep people to come and help you make the video so you have to do everything yourself so we went to sound recording studios videography people and so on and finally got the uh, paper published and i it never ever occurred to me to ask what is the impact factor of job because every time i want to learn a new protocol job is a journal i go to so i did not think about it and after i had published i was asked by the administration what is the impact factor i'm sharing it openly here it's 1.4 i spend a lot of time i have published 6 7 8 impact factor papers with less time spent on it so for a time i felt that it was probably not that rewarding but now i realize that because we published that job video there is a lot more reliability for our results other groups have contacted us saying that they had tried this before and it did not work and they made a modification looking at our protocol and it's working for them and uh, our original rna paper that is on the cover of rna does not get noticed as much as the job paper does so my take home message is that please video record everything you do and it has become lot easier than uh, when we did it because now with the better Uh, technology on our mobile phones i think it's only a matter of maybe years maybe months before you'll be able to make videos of the process uh, of the work that you do however we spent a lot of money we actually did the experiment all over twice with two different sets of students because we did not think of video recording it in the first place so my talk if at all it's useful to you it is in the sense that it's a pitch for having videography in your animal houses thank you very much Due to paucity of time, we'll have only one question. Way, way back, 1994, uh, we all are aware of a taxia series with several neurological disorders, which are characterized by specific neural cell death. And there are lots of naturally occurring models available with uh, at least uh, natural changes of neurological disorders. One of which uh, uh, is actually a very nice model of human. in human being see disease and i would like to suggest that you please take a look at this specific model i think it's really well uh from the ideas uh because uh, it will again show delayed death of neurons uh, in certain regions of the cerebellum uh, i really want to laud you and your team for this beautiful piece of work and you you, you showed so convincingly that one mere molecule is going all the the next way thank you thank you thank you very much i now invite dr ds upadhyay sir please to hand over a momento to dr meena pillai please 